Hello, I'm Sensei Alex Kakyo, and the title of today's talk is The Noble Eightfold Path of Buddhism, Part 3. This is the third in a three-part series on the Noble Eightfold Path and how it can help us in daily life. But before we get into that, I'd like to remind you to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I post talks in the future. Also, if you want to do a deep dive into the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, check out my book, Perfectly Ordinary Buddhist Teachings for Everyday Life. It's available on Amazon, and there's a link for a sample chapter of the book in the description for this talk. Now, today we'll be discussing right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. They make up the final tenets of the Noble Eightfold Path, and they're usually known as the meditative teachings. And this is what people think about when they think about Buddhist practice generally. It's a monk or a nun wearing robes similar to mine, and they're seated in quiet repose, holding noble posture without moving, and they have a very blissful, very loving presence. And what I'm going to talk about now is how we get to that point. How do we become the monk or the nun seated with perfect posture and perfect poise? Well, we don't. <laughs> and the reason we don't is because of the first tenet, right effort. And right effort is essentially a mindset that we need to cultivate. And it's not something we do necessarily, it's something we keep doing. And that simply means we keep showing up. We keep trying. We give ourselves permission to be imperfect. We understand that it took years, sometimes decades, for, for that monk or that nun to get where they are. And we didn't see their struggle. We didn't see them squirming on the cushion. We didn't see them struggling to sit quietly for long periods of time. We just saw the end product. So right effort simply means that we're going to give ourselves permission to walk our own path. That we'll keep trying. That we'll keep putting in the effort. That's why when people ask me how long they should meditate, I just tell them one minute. Now that may seem very short to some people. It may seem very long to other people. But if we only do that, if we just say, I'm going to meditate for one minute a day, that gives us that space to keep trying. So on the days where that's honestly all we can do, that's fine. We only committed to a minute. On the days we can do a lot more, we can do that as well. But the goal is, the point is, that we continue practicing every day. Even the Buddha himself had to practice right effort. It took six years after he left the palace for him to realize enlightenment. And after that, he continued training and continued practicing for another 45 years until his death. So right effort says simply that we are no better or no worse than the Buddha. We are human beings. And the only thing we can expect of ourselves is to keep trying, to keep practicing right effort. Next, we have right mindfulness. And right mindfulness, very simply, is us paying attention. Now, this may seem very obvious, but most people don't pay attention. They don't practice right mindfulness. They have an emotion, they have a thought, and they act on it with no idea of what the consequence will be. Or maybe the consequence is something that's clear to them, but they don't care because they're so caught up in their thoughts and their emotions. So the practice of right mindfulness is simply us paying attention to our thoughts, to our speech, to our action, to our body, and to our environment, and then using what we see to make decisions that help us maintain a meditative mind state. So maybe we're walking down the street and we see some people are arguing. Maybe they're about to get into a fight. And because we're practicing right mindfulness, instead of pulling our, our phones and recording the fight, posting it up on social media, we realize, well, this isn't helpful to my meditation. So we turn around and we walk away because that's not something we want to be involved in. Or maybe we are watching something on social media and it, it makes us feel certain thoughts that are unwholesome, anger, rage, 
or maybe it makes us feel sad, grief stricken. And because we're paying attention to our thoughts, because we're practicing again, right mindfulness, we realize, well, this isn't helpful to my meditation, my meditative state. So we shut the laptop, we turn the TV off, we go for a walk instead. And this practice of right mindfulness is very important because it's something we can do anytime, anywhere. And if we practice right mindfulness, that becomes a springboard for other practices of the Noble Eightfold Path. So we practice right mindfulness, we realize we're angry, we want to say something, but we don't want to speak unskillfully, we want to practice right speech. So we hold our tongue. We wait until we calm down and then we speak. Or maybe we're practicing right mindfulness and we realize we want to do something that's unwholesome. That's not in keeping with the dharmic principles. But because we're paying attention, we notice this. And we don't get down on ourselves, we celebrate it. We noticed it. We stopped ourselves before we made a mistake and we make a better decision instead. So that's right mindfulness. It's simply paying attention. And that ties in with right effort because we are going to make mistakes. We are human beings. So if we practice right mindfulness and, ooh, I said that and that was not okay. Or I did something that was not wholesome, was not compassionate, was not in, in keeping with the dharmic principles that I've been training for. Well, we go back to right effort and we try again the next day. And that becomes a very healthy, very life-affirming cycle. And every time we go through that cycle, we get a little better. We get a little closer to our goal of attaining nirvana. And finally, we arrive at right concentration. Now, it's important to remember that when we practice meditation, we're not just sitting there letting our minds wander. Rather, we pick a point of focus, a point of concentration, and we learn to focus our thoughts on that. And if our minds wander, not a big deal. We just bring our thoughts back, our focus back to our point of concentration. Now, generally speaking, I train students to use their breath as their focus of their concentration. Why? Because we're always breathing. So if we use our breath as our focus, we can do that anywhere in any situation, in a boardroom, in a car, on the cushion. And practicing meditative breathing is very simple. We breathe in and out through the nose. Doing so engages the parasympathetic nervous system, lets our body know it's okay to calm down and relax. And then as we do that, for every inhale, we extend our belly button, allowing our diaphragm to drop into our summit cavity, allowing our lungs to get a full lung full of air, again, sending signals that it's okay to relax. And we do that, we just breathe. And that meditative breath, that technique I just explained to you is the way that yogis and Buddhist masters have dropped into deep, deep states of concentration known as samadhi for thousands of years. So there's no deep secret, there's no trick to it, it's just breathing. But let's say we struggle with the meditative breath. Maybe we have some physical handicap that disallows us from doing it. Maybe we have some trauma associated with our breath, so breathing just isn't a good point of focus for us. Well, we're in luck because there was a 5th century Buddhist monk by the name of Buddha Gosa. He wrote a text called the Visuddhi Magga or the Path to Purification where he actually gives us 40 points of concentration that we can use for our meditation. And if you want, you can research the text on your own. I'll just give you a couple points today that you can use. One of them is a body of water. There's a reason people like going to the ocean and looking at the waves or looking at a lake because water is an excellent thing to concentrate on for meditation. And we, not realizing it, drop into a meditative state simply by looking at water. A fish tank is another example. So if you have trouble concentrating on the breath, go to the beach, go to the lake shore, sit down, just stare at the water for a while. Maybe set your timer. Don't look at the phone or the laptop. That's not why you're there. Just look at the water and take it all in. Fire is another point of concentration. So we can light a candle maybe on our altar. We do a light offering to Buddha. Then we sit on our cushion and we just watch the flame. That's why people like sitting around campfires. 
we don't realize it, but that again drops us into a very natural meditative state without us realizing it. Now we're just doing it on purpose with a candle. And finally, we can use the sky or clouds. So let's say, um, again, let's say you have some sort of an injury. Sitting doesn't work for you that well. Lay down on your back, look up at the clouds. Do your best to not fall asleep, but looking at the clouds, sky gazing is another form of concentration that we can use to drop into meditative states. And if our mind wanders during our meditation from the water, from the flame, from the clouds, it's not a big deal. We just bring our focus back. So those are the meditative teachings of the Noble Eightfold Path. Right effort, which is simply us keeping, promising to keep going. Right mindfulness, which is us paying attention to our body, speech, and mind in our environment. And right concentration, which is us simply choosing a po point of focus whether it's the breath, a body of water, a flame, or a cloud. So if our mind wanders, we can bring our focus back to our object of focus, creating space between us and our thoughts, us and our emotion. And then that makes it easier for us to practice the morality and the wisdom teachings of the path. It all goes in a very healthy cycle. Buddhism is all about lists, and it's all about cycles. You'll realize that as you watch these talks. But that's it for today. I hope it was helpful. If you'd like to read articles I've written on Buddhist practice, you can do that at my blog, The Same Old Zen. I'll post a link to my blog in the description for this talk. And if you'd like to continue the conversation, leave a question in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you guys, and I'll promise I'll respond. So until next time, Amitabha.